So I, for those who don't know me, appreciate many of you, uh, I am Sister Elizabeth Hill. I am the President Emerita of St. Joseph's College, and I'm here because Dr. Calariso, unfortunately, is not able to be with us tonight, uh, but I've been asked to sort of step in and uh, try to uh, fill in for him. And it's a great delight for me to do that because I really had the joy uh, of working for many years with uh, Dr. Thomas Travis. Um, and uh, I think on behalf, on his behalf, I really want to say a welcome to all of you. Uh, a special thank you to the faculty committee uh, that conceived of this lecture series. And I'm happy to say I just heard that it's going to continue next year. Uh, began as a part of the centennial, but it's going to continue next year so that you'll have the opportunity to come back and hear more words of wisdom from the uh, wonderful faculty here at St. Joseph's. And I certainly also want to thank Dr. Uh, Eckert Norton because um, I know that she's going to be a wonderful speaker and will share her experience and wisdom with us tonight. And I see many of her students nodding their heads, so so we have I think we have we have a treat. We're in for a treat. Uh, and I know that uh, Linda Fonte is going to say uh, many lovely words about Tom in a minute, but I just want to take one minute uh, to just reminisce a little bit because when Tom joined us, uh, he came as basically a callow youth, if I can put it that way. <laughs> fresh out of graduate school. Uh, his son, Jack, was a, a Gerber baby, uh, as we spoke about him. And uh, Barbara, of course, was very, very beautiful. So many things have changed. Uh, Tom, 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 is not, Tom is not a callow youth, and Jack is no longer a Gerber baby, but Barbara is still beautiful. So, And when Tom joined us, uh, he was working very closely with Sister Mary Florence, and I think I can say in all honesty that she has made him what he is. <laughs> right? Right, Tom? That's, that's true. Uh, and one of the things that he said to her very early on when he joined us was that he would only be with us for five years because, of course, you know, as a young man, he saw this as a chance to really be the launching pad for his career. So that was okay, and the five years came and they went and then 10 years came and they went, and then 20, and then 30, and then more. And I just want to say that we were so delighted that the five years became 30 plus. And just when you think about it, that Tom Travis has contributed to more than a third of the history and life of this college. When you think about that. And he did it, he did it with grace, with compassion, with courage, with creativity, with ingenuity and with all the things that really helped to make the college strong and successful. So, Tom, I say tonight we're here to both applaud you, but really to thank you. And I want to say in my best Brooklynese, you've done good. <laughs> and now I turn it over to Linda, who will say lovely things. Good evening. The legacy of Dr. Thomas G. Travis can be summed up in one word, opportunity. When Tom arrived at St. Joseph's in 1978, he said he would stay for five years. She already stole my line, okay. <laughs> he did that and added 30 more. His job was to head up the relatively new division of general studies that served adult learners. At the time, there was a push at both the federal and state levels to encourage adults to go back to college for accelerated degree completion. These were typically people who screwed up the first time they were in the, in the world of higher ed. While complying with national standards and best practices for adult learners, he did not judge them by their past, but gave them a chance for the future. The 18-year-old self that was reflected in that less than impressive transcript was not the 30-year-old responsible adult now standing before him who now realized the importance of having a college degree. He also understood the unique concerns of adult students, aging parents, childcare issues, demanding jobs and financial worries, not to mention their own health problems. He would forgive one or two or three or four or five bad semesters because he believed that if given a chance, adult students could do anything they put their mind to. The result is evidenced by the success of our graduates. Our alums include a deputy president of the Borough of Brooklyn, the first commissioner of the New York City Department of Emergency Management, interim CEO of Bellevue Hospital Center, high-ranking NYPD officials, executive administrators in both the business and healthcare field, and a gaggle of lawyers and nurses. Thank you, nurses. Opportunity. At one time, Tom refused to get on a plane. Then he and Barbara decided to take a trip to Paris, and the Long Island Railroad didn't stop there. 
So off they flew. When I plan a vacation, I check out the tourist attractions, the restaurants, not Tom. He would study the country's history and culture. He wanted to understand the essence of the people. After Paris, there was no stopping him. When you saw a photos book on his desk, you know he was going places. Now that he was over his fear of flying, in April of 2009, he joined the students on a service trip to Sutiaba, Nicaragua. He was moved by the poverty that he witnessed and knew there was not much chance in getting them out of it without providing the children with a decent education. He started helping one particular family by paying their daughter's tuition at the parochial school, the Colegio Santa Lucia, which served primary and secondary students. For her, this experience was worlds away from the conditions in which she was living and the public school she attended. Then he asked friends and colleagues to sponsor more children. Through Tom's efforts, there are now 40 children enrolled in that program. When he returned to Sutiaba the following year, with some fundraising and lots of elbow grease supplied by the Madres and the Padres, the San Jose, St. Joseph, preschool was established, with 50 little ones now enrolled. Tom also initiated a university program for 21 students who have graduated from the Colegio Santa Lucia. The young man that I sponsor at the university is on his way to becoming a pharmacist. And one young lady has recently been accepted to the pre pre prestigious university that trains the country's medical doctors. She is sponsored by Sister Elizabeth. Go figure. <laughs> Opportunidad. Tom was the dean for both campuses, and we were always happy to have our Tom days. He started his Brooklyn mornings in the kitchen of Lorenzo with a ring ding or a yodel or some other unhealthy breakfast. Nutrition was not a strong point. Nobody's perfect. Then, armed with a legal pad and his favorite mechanical pencil, he greeted each staff member to say good morning and see if we had any business to discuss. He somehow managed to find time for everyone who needed it. Then we had meetings, more meetings, and meetings about meetings. He always provided us with a voice. We didn't work for him, we worked with him. Tom believed that you should be happy in your work and he would do whatever it took to make that happen. He made us a family, dysfunctional at times, but a family nonetheless. If there was a conflict, he would offer to meet with both parties to smooth things out. He was always there to cheer us on in good times and comfort us during the bad ones. His support was something we could always count on. He guided our careers by his mentoring, encouraged us to go to graduate school, for which I went kicking and screaming, gave us advice and counsel, and helped us move up the ladder. The fact that I started working here as a clerk typist and am now an associate dean is certainly proof of that. Opportunity. It was more like a miracle. <laughs> At my first Christmas general studies, we had our famous lobster lunch and then went to the reception area to exchange Kris Kringle gifts. Tom was distributing envelopes, and this appeared to be very excited by this. I thought, Christmas boat is baby. I opened my envelope ever so carefully so as not to have the check fall out and drop to the floor. No check. What I found in the envelope was much better than money. They were Tom's words. Words of thanks for everything you did and how well you did it. Whether you're six or 60, it's nice to hear a good job. And this wasn't just an annual, it was a regular occurrence. He was the best boss ever. Um, your legacy at the college people and the lessons that you taught and the opportunities that you provided. You forever touched the lives of countless students, dozens of families in El Pueblo, Pequeño de Sutiaba, and your grateful and admiring staff. You are and always will be a legend and my hero. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good evening, everyone. Um, Linda, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. And Paul. I, I second that emotion. I second all of that. Well, uh, my name is David Sapala Holtzman, and I've been asked to introduce the speaker for this evening, who is Dr. Margaret Eckert Norton. And the reason I've been asked this, I suspect, is because.
because it's assumed that those people with hyphenated last names should stick together. <laughs> I happen to be a fan. So I'd like to introduce Margaret. And um, I should tell you, she's been a part of the faculty at St. Joseph's since 2008. She got her BS uh, from Cornell, her master's degree from Columbia, and her PhD in nursing research and theory development from NYU. In her doctoral program, she twice received the Jacqueline Fawcett Award, award for nursing um, theory, and she was, in fact, valedictorian of that program. Very nice. Dr. Norton is a member of the Advo Advocacy and Public Outreach Corps Committee of the National Endocrine Society and has served as president of the National Endocrine Nurses Society. <clears throat> as a nurse who hates hospitals, much of her clinical practice is do devoted to keeping people out of them. Dr. Norton serves as a nurse practitioner and diabetes education educator at SUNY Downstate Clinics. Storytelling, based in narrative inquiry, is central to her research and practice. Many of you may have seen there was an article in the New York Times by a doctor about a, a week ago that was very, very in touch with what you're about to hear tonight. One of her colleagues said of Margaret that she is a unique academic having both qualitative and quantitative research skills. Yes. It is unique ear. Yes. To unique ear. <clears throat> Margaret's work has focused on truly standing to someone as they to the confusing lab labyrinth of healthcare, helping to witness with them all that happened while facing illness. Fort Greenbrook has been Margaret's home for over 30 years, where she and her husband Richard have heard many, many stories from their daughters. Many, many stories, I'm sure, Tracy and Rebecca, as they were growing up. Very much a nurse's nurse, Margaret is as eloquent an expositor as she is a good listener. You are in for a treat this evening, ladies and gentlemen. I give you Margaret Eckert Thorpe. Thank you so very much. I guess you know you're almost grown up when you, you have a long introduction and you hardly even recognize yourself. <laughs> so um, let me pull up my first slide. So storytelling in healthcare, who faces it? And as heard, this is the Dr. Tom Travis Centennial Lecture in Criminal Studies. Disclosure from Columbia, but I did it when I was 40 years old. I'd already been a nurse for more than 20 years. And I went back from my doctorate when I was in my 50s. So I just have to say that I have a special debt of gratitude for educators like Tom Travis, who had the vision and the commitment to stand by adult learners like myself. <laughs> These things get kind of emotional. <laughs> I do have a few SJC is part of my community, and part of the reason I'm here at SJC is, yes, I've been a Fort Greene resident for over 30 years, and who want to walk 12 blocks to their job instead of taking a train to Manhattan or wherever else? So when my good friend Laurel Green said, oh, there might be an opening at St. Joe's, and I said, well, maybe I ought to apply. And the rest is history. I am very grateful for my time here at St. Joe's. It's been a really wonderful, supportive environment. And uh, I thank my nursing faculties. Many are here today. And in particular, 
Dr. Laurel Breen, because she and I were joined at the hip during our doctoral program, and much of what I have to say today is certainly because of the wonderful reflection and the professional feedback that Laurel's given me over the years. Then, of course, there's my family. And my family of origin, of course, is very important and very large. And uh, my sister came in from Texas, Dr. Eckert and Felsen, and I really appreciate all of that. But also my husband, Richard, you heard about him, and my daughters, Tracy and Rebecca, and my son-in-laws, Mike and Rick. And I'm just really thrilled that our stories are still unfolding together and that I almost don't care where they wind up anymore so long as we stay on the journey together. <laughs> but most especially for my patients, from day one in, in my first day of clinical as a nursing student, which I still remember with recurring nightmares, <laughs> until last Friday when I was seeing patients at, at Downstate, I have learned so much from every encounter and I really owe them a, a tremendous debt of gratitude for what I am professionally and personally. So as David mentioned, we're hearing a lot about narratives lately and of course there was this wonderful uh, article by Dr. Cooler. Um, and it was really about how doctors sometimes just don't have time or don't have the skills to really hear what their patients are about. And Dr. Cooler's story was he was seeing a patient who was, had a terminal illness. And the first thing he asked was, when was your last bowel movement? <laughs> and the patient said, you know, doctor, just because I'm dying, doesn't mean there isn't more to me than my bowel movements. So, and I, I think I couldn't have said it better and maybe I could just stop the lecture here. But as Dr. Cooler says, doctors have many skills, but we often fail to appreciate people's messy, beautiful lives. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today are some of the messy and beautiful stories from my patients many years. And I want to start with a few stories that were me in forming the kinds of things I wanted to do when I finally grew up and went into my doctoral program. The first one I call the woman, the child, and the mother. And this occurred about three or four years after I had finished my initial nursing program. I was working in a women's clinic here in New York City. And I called the name of a patient, and who stands up at this adorable 14-year-old girl, hair and pigtails with white ribbons and matching white knee socks. And her mother is with her, and they walk into my office. And the mother says, my daughter is pregnant, and she's embarrassed the family and my community by this pregnancy, and I don't want her to have it. And I'm all of about 24 years old, and I'm thinking, this is a lot. And thankfully, I had a very kind and available supervisor. And I said, we need to have a conversation, and I need some other people to help us with this conversation. I went and got my supervisor. She took the mother aside. I stayed with the young girl, who told me in no uncertain terms that she did not want to end this pregnancy. She very much wanted to have this child. She started crying. We had many conversations over the next few weeks. And she wound up uh, going into a home for, for which we were the medical providers, a uh, home for, for girls who were pregnant and wanted to have their babies. And eight months later, through the door, comes this young woman. Pigtails are gone. No more bows and matching knee socks, but a beautiful child and 16-year-old boyfriend in tow. And I thought, wow, there's a story that really needed to be heard. Fast forwarding a couple of decades, I finished my nurse practitioner program. I'm teaching at another, uh, another college. Right here in Brooklyn. And 
I come from a small town in upstate New York. Upstone. It's only 100 miles north of here, but anything north of like Westchester is upstate. And uh, so I'm from this small town, but been living in Brooklyn for a long time. My student is from Russia, and she had been a physician in Russia, but couldn't get through all the red tape to become a physician, so she's becoming a nurse practitioner here in the U.S. And she's about eight months pregnant, and her husband, father of this child, had died of, a, of, of acute onset um, cancer just a couple months earlier, and I'm feeling very protective of this, of this student of mine. And the patient we're seeing um, is from the Caribbean, and he has diabetes, thankfully something I know something about finally, you know, because I know a lot about Russia. I've learned quite a bit about the Caribbean. Um, and we listened to what was going on with him, and then we went to speak to the doctor of the clinic who was born in Calcutta. So I call this story the UN clinic, okay? And this is pretty much what our lives are like when we're delivering care here in New York, okay? You call a name, you never know what it's, who or what is going to be. And um, I was thinking there were many opportunities for somebody's story to get really screwed up in this whole wonderful swill of, of care. And we managed to get a few good things done, and I was quite proud of that interaction. But then that moved into the next story, gas pains. Several weeks, months after this, doctor in charge of clinic said, okay, this guy's usually quite quick. Why don't you see him? Because, you know, we're running a little late with clinic and we need some extra help. I said, sure, no problem. I went to speak to him and doesn't speak English as, as a first language. And he, he goes, gas, gas. And I'm looking through his chart and I'm seeing gas pain, gas pain, gas pain, eight or nine months. And I try to say in patois a little bit of something and he laughs at my, and so we tried. And I said, I had the kind of unique idea, why don't I examine him? And at the point, it was quite evident that the man had an enlarged liver that, that was very firm and probably had metastatic disease. So this was the first of the stories that had gotten missed that was really serious trouble in my world of awareness, okay? I, there maybe had been others, but this is one that really hit home for me and how sweet this man was and everyone kept giving him the usual just for gas. And I don't know if we really could have changed his outcome, but we should have known sooner what we were dealing with. So then decisions, decisions. I finally lost my mind altogether and decided to act at a doctor way. And I said, well, you know, I'm already a pretty competent professional. Why should I, you know, deprive myself of, of having the full alphabet soup after my name? There are so many people who know less than me who have those letters, and I'll, I'll not out, just like that. So with all the great naivete, even at my advanced age, entering into I'll be out in for years or less. And I did whiz through all the uh, coursework, but it took me to land idea about what I was going to do for my doctoral work. And I started thinking about what diabetes means to the patients that I actually see and realized I didn't really understand what it meant to them. I understood what I thought should be done about it, but actually what it meant to them, I was pretty clueless about it. And I had been a diabetes educator for more than 20 years. So I really ha hated myself for this, but then decided, all right, look at traditional healthcare. Traditionally, what you want to do is cure the problem. And that's nice if there's an antibiotic or some drug cure, then you can do that. And then I had anchored in something called Kumpkins or here, the amount of, of uh, of congruence there is between what the patient does and what the provider wants them to do. Now, how many of you in this room do what you're told? Cons is that for adults. Okay? So, right away, I knew traditional health was not going to be the route I was going. And, of course, it's really modeled on obedience and conformity. That's, that's what they expect. So, let's look at the kind of newer 
form of traditional health care, which is called chronic illness model or chronic care model. There are several names for it. And supposedly this has this built into it, but it's mostly for providers. They're working on having more decision support for the people who actually have the problems, but it's a little harder to do that. Um, the, still, the expectation is a lot of self-management, because if you have a problem like diabetes for you see your doctor 15 minutes, so it's really up to you to manage. And so that's supposed to yield a productive partnership. However, the literature tells us that only about a third of people with diabetes actually have their blood sugars where they should be. So two-thirds of the world with diabetes are still struggling with getting diabetes under control. So I had to ask myself, why would I, as my doctoral work, do something in the traditional realm? So I landed on the work of Margaret Newman, who is a nurse theorist. Um, her theory is health is expanding consciousness, and it works through the unitary transformative paradigm, treating the person as an entire person, not just treating a diagnosis. And it looks at illness instead of something to cure or to scrub out, but illness is an integrating factor from which you learn and, 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 and you become informed. And um, we really uh, work hard at making sure that, that instead of with a chronic illness that we give you any hope of it being cured, we are giving you the sense of being able to handle it on your own. So it's really an authentic partnership and looks more at pattern recognition instead of diagnoses. And the way this is accomplished is through transformative nursing presence, being there for the people who need you most. And hopefully, it will expand your consciousness and obliterate the need for conformity and obedience and actually allow for transformation. So this is a one quick slide of what is a very long process. Um, narrative inquiry that I used um, Margaret Newman's protocol for this study and uh, had to be approved by um, institutional review boards. And my participants, I did will pseudonyms on my slides today. They picked names that they thought were very nice to recognize themselves in the literature, if you get it. And there was no direct recruitment by me. I had to wait for my colleagues as assistant doctors to send me pieces. Each patient uh, paid $15 for their time for the interviews. And it was a purpose of sample. I wanted to talk to women who were of uh, African American descent with type 2 diabetes, who were either uninsured or on Medicaid, who had limited financial resources. Um, and we used uh, third party and snowball recruitment so they could tell their friends who were similarly situated about my study. Um, and we conducted at least two interviews with, with uh, the participants. And I developed a construing diagram, which I'm going to show you examples of, um, as ways to give uh, feedback, feedback to each of the um, participants. So chapter one, I get started. I get all approved. As you know, I'm, I'm ready to make a hasty move through my doctoral work. And the first person that the nurses send me is the one who chooses the name May Dale. Mail is in her 80s and has a very long um, medical history aside from diabetes. And the nurses come running down all it's a busy day in clinic. They say, Margaret, Margaret, we think she'd be perfect for your study. And I look at my watch and I said, okay, we have an hour. We can get it done in you know, her appointments in an hour and a half and we can do this. And I quickly kind of grab one of the exam rooms, get my recorder, we're going to record the whole thing. And I start pumping out questions that, thinking back on it, I mean, I don't even remember much of what happened, but I could see from the expression on her face that she felt completely intimidated by the way in which I was asking her questions. And she was starting to say less and less and saying things like, I'm not sure about that, and I'm really not sure how to answer that. And we went through this for about an hour. And then it was time for her to go see her doctor, for which she was very relieved. And I, <laughs> I ran down the hall, and I was going to make a copy of our 
interview together so that she could cherish it. And, <laughs> and, and lo and behold, my tape recorder was not working. <laughs> Thank God. Because I don't think I wanted to relive exactly how that interview went. went. So, and no matter how much I asked and pleaded, she wouldn't come back to see me for another interview, and I completely understand. So from my first interview, which was probably the most informative for me in terms of how to conduct narrative inquiry, one must be prepared. So being unprepared means things will not go well. Trying to fit in required tasks. Does this sound familiar to anybody? All right. So as nurses, we're very busy and we're trying to get it all done, okay? And sometimes you have to prioritize something other than the required tasks. So thankfully, Deborah Brown emerges. And we have a very lengthy interview. And part of my job as a doctoral student in narrative inquiry is to get a holistic um, description of the pattern. And her pattern would be emerging self supported by scripting the drama. So Deborah. This is her diagram, which is sort of something in between an emoji and an EKG. <laughs> so it's, it's, you can see where the scribbles are, and that's all. You don't have to really read any of the text, but just get the notion of where the scribbles are. That's when the energy is kind of disrupted and not, things aren't going well. And Deborah's first words to me was, I was always attracted to drama. guy she really liked. He was in the service. She wanted to marry him. But her mother said, no, you're too young. You can't do that. And so she went down a road of many relationships and many more drugs. And she wound up him away several times to keep all of this from her parents, from her parents, from her mom in particular. Uh, when she was using heroin, she said, I never got sick. It was like a drug that kept you from feeling sick. And I thought, my goodness, this is quite amazing. And she says, as soon as I stopped using drugs, it's when everything went wrong. So they found out she had hepatitis C. That's when they found out she had diabetes. That's when they found out she had the high blood pressure. That's when they found out the long litany of things that she was now trying to deal with. She did give up drugs eventually, but not without some drama. Uh, she was with her boyfriends, and they were uh, her apartment building, and the cop had, in their directions, because someone had tipped them off, that they were dealing drugs out of their apartment. Her boyfriends all jumped out the fourth floor window, but she went to jail because she said, I'd rather be alive and in jail than jump out the fourth floor window and kill myself. And she was kind of laughing about it. I mean, she said, I really made that decision. And she actually added to her story, the most important people in my life are my mother, my children, and me. She had this wonderful self-protective quality about her, despite the, her drug use. And she was one of the very few people who actually said that she was important to her. Okay, So I thought it was a really remarkable story. So she's, she's been off drugs now for over 15 years at the time I saw her. And unfortunately, she required diabetes. She, she required insulin. Increase, so that's a tough thing for someone who's already done some needlework and stuff. So it was a very compelling story. But the way it helped her with understanding things and the way I understood her better is like, to your script, that you're going to handle it better. Ms. Johnson co-defenders of self emerging from a cloud of betrayal and inaction. The major point of her story was that at the age of nine, she started what became many years of sexual abuse by an uncle or a confidant of family. And this went on until she was 14, and then she told her mother. And her mother accused her of making up stories and saying horrible things and kicked her out of the house, and she had to go live with, with her grandmother for a while. She also started using drugs. And she used the drugs to kind of numb all of this pain. And she actually get away from this, this 
gentleman blocked her until she actually left the country. So she came to the United States, where she eventually had her children, her two daughters. Um, she worked um, at, at the hotel at the World Trade Center and never missed a day of work, except she had hurt her back in August of, you know, of 2001, and in, when September 11th happened, she happened to be on sick leave, and her whole building and life blew up. Um, her drug use got worse at that time, and then eventually she was able to get clean. She looked in the mirror and decided, this is not who I want to be. And then I drew the big arrows at the end as her two daughters become her twin towers of support. So this was, and diabetes, spoiler alert, diabetes is not the most important thing going on in most of my patients' lives. So Gloria Brown. Service, love, and understanding supported by authentic presence through avoidance of practice skepticism. So that's a mouthful. But you can see this pattern nice rolling along and the heart at the end. This was the most remarkable positive stories I had ever heard in my whole life. This is a woman who was just, she's been in a 55-year-old, 55-year marriage now. Um, she had two daughters in the early 60s and then wound up getting pregnant again in the late 70s with her son. She was, uh, um, she was a home attendant. She took care of a lot of people who um, had diabetes, and that's how she learned about it. She had had diabetes for over 30 years before she ever got to see a diabetes or actually get the information that she really wanted about her diabetes. Even she had retinopathy and other problems going on. But she maintained this beautiful life. She actually ran a home for disabled adults. One of them in that home got pregnant. She adopted that then as her own. And as I was listening to this story, I started asking myself, what's the real story going to happen? I'd heard so many difficult stories. I had trouble getting my head around the fact that it really is her story. When it finally clicked in my own head and I leaned in and listened, I was just so relieved and so privileged to have actually been able to have heard and felt and received her story. At the end of our conversation, she even expressed her gratitude. She says, there are so many times when people say they're going to listen and they don't really. And I thought, oh, God, she didn't notice. And I was so, I was this close to like missing the story, which is why I added to the pattern from my perspective skepticism, learned that I really can't just assume that bad things are the only things that happen, that good things do happen in this world, and they're really quite amazing. Nicole Long, breaking from the prison and trying something new, supported by being to self. So we could also call this a careful Nor interested. Uh, the family mostly moves um, to New York. Uh, she has an older brother whom her mother is very close. Her brother dies quite suddenly in his early 20s. Um, the mother at this point has Parkinson's disease, and so Nicole is left being the primary caretaker for the mother who is very, very distraught at the loss of her favorite child. Uh, Nicole had arranged uh, to move her into a, uh, a, a kind of a managed uh, care facilities because she was becoming too much to, to work with. And the movers were on their way to move her mom to the new facility. And the mother says, you know, I think I don't want to go. And Nicole was like beside herself. She had two small boys at the time. And she just went out onto the terrace and said, oh, God, you know, sometimes I just wish she'd die. And she walked back in, and her mother did not have a pulse. She had to call 911. And brothers gained. You know, and there actually is some literature about how trauma should not be relived. 
and, and you shouldn't actually try to debrief it too much, but that actually doing something mindless like a video game can help you reorganize your thoughts. So she also um, you know, has these two wonderful sons who have become the center of her life. She wants to go back to college now. Um, there's a little bit of the uh, line that's moving upward because her life is starting to come together now. She has gotten past a lot of the grief and the guilt over what happened to her mother. And of course, the diabetes was of a minimal concern. May Grant valiantly navigating a sea of illness than staying a new course. May was born in, I believe it was South Carolina. She was the youngest of, uh, I think, six or seven children, and her mother died in childbirth with her. Her, husband, her father eventually remarried, but she didn't get along with the, with the new stepmother. So she came to New York City to live with her much older sister, who became her de facto mother. May actually uh, gets married, and her daughter develops uh, a sarcoma and has to have an above-the-knee amputation. Her husband then gets diagnosed with um, a kidney problem and has to go on dialysis. Her, her, her mother for her sister also dies within the next few years uh, in her adult life. So uh, she has been different diabetes herself and include thyroid problem, asthma, uh, sleep apnea. She has the diabetes. And one of the things that she said I have diabetes, I have hypertension, I have asthma, I could die from any one of these things. And not just keep giving me medicine and no one tells me what I'm doing and, and no one tells me how the drugs work together. And she, the family still turns to because not only did her daughter survive the sarcoma and is getting around well, the daughter now has a son and now that son has and it's just an amazing, so this is where navigating a sea of illness and, and valiantly staying a new course, Shinley has made some decisions, trying to minimize some of the medicine, which I think She actually lived in this neighborhood, and it's not an easy thing to do. So just people have to eat what they can afford, and that, that actually was a recurring theme as well. Sorry and weight, mutually achieving goals. This was one of the more interesting um, cultural uh, experiences that I had um, in the course of my data collection. And she was born in Barbados, and she worked very hard um, staying in school and, and, and able to bring herself into the United States where she marries um, a pastor and she becomes a pastor and then she develops diabetes and they don't have any health insurance. So uh, she's very, very worried about how is she going to manage and what will happen and, and we had a long conversation and she said to me, someone who looks like you is going to get care before and I had to agree. This is how our world is. And she we went back and she told me, you know, I told my husband to talk to somebody about what it's like to be big. And I told him that it wasn't a black woman, it was a white woman that I talked to. And he was astounded. And, and that she felt comfortable enough to acknowledge our differences but accept the fact that you know we're all in this complicated garden together. And she was able to tell me straight out what she was thinking and feeling. So diabetes was a very big concern for her. Her husband had had some new diagnoses um, as well. And we talked about ways um, that she might be able to, this was before the Affordable Care Act and other things were happening, um, how she might continue to get care that might be affordable. So Rebecca Cuthbert, her pattern was loving acceptance supported by tender appreciation and active vigilance. So 
she's this amazing woman who not only raised her own two children, but also her sister's five children. And she was a home attendant. And she w really had this priority about education. And when her daughter had gone to as much school in Jamaica as you could get without having to pay a large tuition, uh, Miss Cuthbert moved her whole family legally up here to Brooklyn. And she was so proud when her daughter not only graduated from college, but also got a master's degree in education. Her son is also a huge technologist. Um, she lives in public housing. She always wanted an education, but she had to take care of ailing parents while she was in Jamaica. She tried going to an adult education class for a while, but it didn't work out. But she just really had this priority that her kids would be educated and is so proud. And that's why those two stars are there, um, that her son and her, her daughter actually were you know, graduates college. And then she developed diabetes blood pressure. And my hearing what was going on with her, sometimes her blood sugar would be in the 300, in the 500s, and then her blood pressure would be like in the 300s. And this, this, you hear that kind of story, and it rings bells in your head that this doesn't sound like your typical type 2 diabetes. So I had to take off my uh, doctoral student hat from my clinic hat and arrange for her to have some special testing done. Um, because I thought that she really had actually an endocrine disorder. Um, one of the great, great sadnesses in her life, and this is what hurt me, and, and which I call it tender, tender appreciation for the fact that she shared her story with me. She said, you know, my daughter decided to move to Florida with the grandkids because I live in a place that they call a building. They don't grow, I live a home. And they, she wanted to have the kids grow up in a home. And it really hurt her that she had done so much for her daughter and looked forward to doing similarly for her grandkids. Uh, she does have her son. She did have her son. hurt me when, when I heard that. And so then the act of vigilance was like thinking of her physical condition. And she said, again, she gave her daughter all of this, and we stay in touch. Desiree Matthews, choreography. So this is, again, a fairly upbeat story. Um, she, uh, again, grew up in the Caribbean. They ate a lot of Caribbean food. That she came from this family that were really kind of politically active. They joined a lot of, you know, organizations, and and so when she developed her diabetes, um, she naturally wanted to be part of, you know, these education. She happens to take decorator profession. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, economics may. And she's always been able to take care of herself and support herself. And one of the things said to me that when she developed diabetes and knew she had to like check her blood sugar at home, and you, you, you poke your finger, you get a drop of blood, and you put it on the stick in the meter, and you get a number out. And she goes, you know, a drop of blood every day is a lot. And to nurse, you're like, that's nothing. <laughs> a drop of, you're lucky, a drop of blood, at that, you're a lot. unity of, of being and that eliminating that one little drop, even gave her, she knew she had to do it, but it, it was very, very challenging for her. So she actually had her diabetes in really pretty good shape. I learned a lot about what diabetes meant to her. And her favorite exercise, she goes out dancing with her cousins every chance she gets. And so we have the let's go dancing there. And I, I suspect that part of the reason she's doing so well with her diabetes, she loves to dance. Even though she's a cake decorator, she learned not to tell you the frosting. And, and she's, a, she's a very willing student who does what she has to do. In fact, the meaning of that drop of blood is very powerful for her. So let's just summarize, as we can say. 
So each of the persons that I spoke with, there were 13 who had um, actually two interviews, and so my pattern identification is validated by them. When I, when I talk to them, I, I know that I've gotten their story straight. Actually, it was many, many months after I spoke to them that I actually was able to see their patterns, but we had spoken about um, everything that I had captured as my data. And you'll see some interesting things here. And, and they don't say like diabetes and hypertension and things like this, but these are ways of describing a human being and a way a human being and a nurse interact. But included down there are the cautionary items in yellow, which are being unprepared, fitting in required tests, and practice skepticism. We will have our bad days. And to minimize our bad days, as I tell my students, you've all heard it, there's no such thing as perfection in the human world, but it's all about ends. And to have even a better day than you had before is an important one. So then we also look generally at diabetes from the women that I spoke with. So we have some called unitary patterns, patterns to help understand the whole person. I call strength that they went through. And part of what I hear in the stories is my own voice going, what would I have done to the circumstances? How would, would I have been able to get both my daughter's master's degrees? So the other thing is unique authority. This is why the compliance and obedience models don't work, because these women know their lives. They are expert in their lives. And we can't come up with plans of care for them that are imposed from above, because this is what you're supposed to do. And if you would do it this way, you would be better, OK? And we have to rethink how we communicate. What is our plan of care? Because if it's something that they are totally unable and it's an unsustainable plan, then they won't waste their time with it and you've wasted your time as well. And the notion of self-similarity, that because they're accomplished in their own lives, there's no reason why they wouldn't also be accomplished in taking care of themselves if they're given the right tools in a way that is meaningful to them. And not just, well, if the medicine makes you sick, you still have to take it which leads me to the first of the disruptive patterns. We've heard the word compliance, and I would like to make the case that compliance is dead. It's not something that has traction with the adult world, particularly in chronic disease. But morbid compliance is something that I actually observed happening in my study participants, in that they would try to do what the doctor told them to do, even if it made them feel sick. Sometimes the medicines didn't agree with them. Sometimes they were starving hungry, but they were you know, still the amount of insulin because the doctor said, you know, I had to take that much insulin. Another problem that they had was delayed access to nurse partnerships, that nurses are increasingly scarce in clinic care. And we heard about my one participant who had 30 years of diabetes and retinopathy before she had a chance to talk to a nurse who actually had the time to tell her about the kinds of things she could do to help with her diabetes. Another thing that occurs and is problematic in communication between and people seeking care is liberalism, that the patients act what the doctor says early. So the doctor says blood sugar always be morning, and sometimes it's 79. And sometimes it's 82, but it's never 80. And she felt this is seriously true, OK? I'm thinking, you know, how do you, but you have such excellent 80. And the, the reverse is also true in that the doctors take very seriously, um, do you take, when the person says, do you take your medicines? And the person says, yes. They say, oh, well, then they take them all the time. But that's almost never true. 
then when they take it literally, they act very affronted or they lie to me. They said they took their medicines. No, they do take their medicines. It's just sometimes if they don't have time to eat, they'll skip it that morning and they will skip it the next day because they might not have enough for the rest of the week. So notion of literalism gets in the way. And then of course, uncontrolled diabetes, which is the reason I started this study, but there were so many reasons why I actually wound up with it. So like a doctoral student, put together a model. And I journeying with the familiar but unknown through the labyrinth of care. I had been a diabetes educator for more than 20 years and a nurse practitioner for more than 10 years. But I didn't really understand what diabetes to my patients. And conversely, many of my patients had had diabetes for decades and didn't really understand the kinds of help that a real partnership could bring them. So we were on this journey together with the familiar but unknown. And this is in the labyrinth of care. We often talk about the maze of healthcare, you know, how a rat gets lost in the maze and may never come out. A labyrinth is intended to be a healing, a place for healing. And you enter it, you get to the center, and you exit, and you're transformed. And it is nurses who are the guides through this labyrinth of care. And they are the ones who make the difference between the unitary patterns that support movement through and the disruptive patterns. Even if they're having a bad day, they can still help you out. So narrative stories in healthcare. What, why do we bother? As a review, they pray the complexity of our daily lives, okay? How many of you have ever been to a doctor? <laughs> How many of you really feel that your provider really gets it, that understands who you are, your struggles are, your accomplishments are, and what your struggles are? <laughs> Depending on the copay? <laughs> someone say something like that. <laughs> and I often think of the question, what if? And when I'm receiving stories, I think, well, I, as I mentioned, I think, well, what if I had those kinds of challenges? What would I do? And they potentiate our mutual transformation. I am different every time I interact with my patients. It's also true of my students and many of my colleagues. Truly, interaction does lead to transformation, except when it doesn't. And that's when you're not really interacting, okay? That's when you're fitting in those required tasks. You have this practice skepticism in your head, well, if only they do what we asked, they would get better. And those kinds of things we have to let go of. And it certainly reveals the challenges of clinical practice in our current healthcare environment. We are very much about efficiency. We have a lot of to get done, right? What are we supposed to do? How do we do this? Can everyone spend two hours with the clients the way I did in my doctoral work? Not necessarily. You can always do a little better. You can always say to somebody, I have 10 minutes with you. What's the most important thing I need? And let them tell. It'll save you time because frankly, you won't be chasing your tail trying to do things for them they're not interested in. And if you're not taking care of what your client needs, they're not coming back. Or they will, but they'll come back in the same terrible shape they were in started and what have you done? So just because time precious, with the most, and those would be the people to us for care. So, one last story. And this is actually a selection from Jacob the Baker by Noah Ben Shea. Jacob, where do you find the strength to carry on in life? Life is often heavy only because we attempt to carry it, said Jacob. But I find strength in the ashes. In the ashes, asked Mr. Gold. Yes, said Jacob, 
with a confirmation that seemed to have traveled a great distance. You see, Mr. Gold, each of us is alone. Each of us is in a great darkness of our ignorance. And each of us is on a journey. In the process of our journey, we must bend to build a fire, light, and warmth, and food. But when our fingers tear at the ground, hoping to find the coals of another's fire, what we can find are the ashes. And in these ashes, which will not give us light or warmth, there may be sadness, but there's also testimony. Because these ashes tell us that somebody else has been And that can be sometimes. I'd be happy to answer to the best of my ability. Any and all, and there are. Anybody? Oh yeah. So I, I usually I do use that line. I have tenants with you. What's the most important thing I need to know? Um, I actually have transitioned over the last year to a new role at Downstate. I see some patients who are recent discharges regardless of their diagnosis, so I'm not just in the diabetes anymore. And it is quite remarkable how focused the acute care arena is on whatever the admitting diagnosis is. And they are discharged to clinic to try and prevent them readmitted, you know, this whole readmission thing. <laughs> so send them to the transitional care clinic. And so I, I it's my mission to keep them out of the hospital. So I have to go through a lot of the stuff about what's going on at home. Do they have their medications? What kind of insurance? All this stuff. So um, I, I, I use it all the time. I had a patient actually tell me the other day, because the karma in this room is really good. <laughs> I thought, wow, I really accomplished something with it. So it was kind of cool. So no, it is my practice. And, and, I, and it does save me time. Because I can come up with an idea that actually, oh yes, I can try that. Because it relates to a need that they have. So very definitely. I don't spend two hours with them. But sometimes I do, if I have to. Yes, Esther. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Breen's still in the room, I think. You, you, need, you need a bunch of peers that support you. So I have faculty. I see Dr. Kalkofan. It's like, it's like Dr. Fletcher. You know, we are all here for each other. There you are. We're here for each other. And you need to find those people who are receptive to your thinking and your being with them. There are many people who are in our profession and who aren't really about this, OK? So you need to find you know, your early adopters you know, of people who are willing to consider this. And you need to, to dent with them and talk to them about it. Um, it's not a good idea to use your family. I've tried. It doesn't work that well. <laughs> they're, they're veterans of my war stories. You know? um, so it's, it's really good to have a professional group. Um, and I would say that that would be, you know, when I was in the middle of, this, of these stories, it was, I couldn't, it was almost th two years before I really had my breakthrough in terms of being able to make sense of them. So, 600 pages of data. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, thank you. So, so only like two of them are. Many of them came from the Kings County um, Diabetes Clinic, and I am not able to fit that in anymore with, so. Um, there are two of them, though, they are still looking forward to my article being published, which is sitting on my computer. I have to fix the references, and actually working on this talk helped me have some insights about that, so hopefully I will. Uh, and I have to consider, you know, like, what my next project would be for this. Thank you for the question. Uh huh. Thank you, Katia. Um, so, initially, I'd like to have a couple of um, peer review publications that are articles, and then um, a monograph would be something I would entertain. Um, and it would be a theory book about the labyrinth of care model. And the, the concepts that came out of this were basically from the pattern recognition of these stories, and so they would be included as part of that. Yes, David. Oh, basically support, but then I, I've crafted my colleagues carefully. <laughs> I don't hang out much with the guys who are like, oh, no, 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 my way to the highway. Um, yeah, so I have a, a long-standing network of physicians with whom I am really grateful for you know, much of what I've learned. Um, and they, in turn, come and get me when they're figuring out stories that are kind of complicated. Yeah, that's what, that's up to me to publish. You know, without that, I haven't really fulfilled my doctoral role. So hopefully we'll get a break and get some publications done. Well, I, I do want to give a shout out to many of the nurses that are here today who are being inducted into our honor society. So congratulations on all that. We actually have a student of ours who's a new admit to our master's program. I'm thrilled to have her today as well. And of course, all your wonderful supportive faces. Thank you all very much. I, I want to thank Margaret one more time for a really wonderful talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as someone who's had some little minor health issues myself, I, I know it is the nurses that have all kept me alive. <laughs> so I'd also like to thank Linda for her wonderful tribute to Tom, and I'd like to thank Tom for being here tonight. It's always a pleasure to see you. And it was a pleasure to see you for 35 years before that, too. Um, thank you, Sister Elizabeth, for, for welcoming us all tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, I'd just like one more thank you to the, the faculty committee that, that helps put this to get the lecture together, uh, David Spala Holtzman and Ray D'Angelo and Joe Ross, and of course, Jamie Vaca, who actually makes everything work. Uh, okay. and, and of course, the, the alumni office, too. We'd, we'd like to, um, we, we'll have six more lectures next year, three in the fall, three in the spring. We'll make sure to hit as many departments and as many of our formal colleagues as possible to, to honor them and to honor the work that's done here in all the, all the departments at St. Joseph's College as we continue to celebrate our centennial. Thanks very much. Thank you.